So doing things a little different this morning, splitting things up, and we're going to we're going to turn to John 16. Anybody warm? <laughs> oh, spring is coming. Right. Um, introduce this new series we're going to do, coming back to John. We've actually, in between other series, been going dipping in and out of John and working our way through it. And the preaching team, when we met and we prayed, and as best as we could discern, we felt God tell us two things, to come back and finish John. And we're at the last few chapters of John, we're going to do that. And that series is called First, comma, Love. Do you see what we did there? First love, first love. And this wonderful section of John are these discourses, Jesus talking to the disciples before he goes, before his execution and his death and resurrection, and then when he returns and these extended discourses with them again and talks about why things had to happen and discipleship and the Holy Spirit being sent and being disciples. But woven through it is this amazing theme that all of that is for one singular purpose, God's love for us in Christ and his desire that we would know that love too. And that's really our focus for this year, with encountering God. That loving God and experiencing him really can bring order to the whole of your life, no matter what is happening. Because it's what brought order to the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't have a political program, economic program. Um, He said, the kingdom of God is at hand, Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And God will then rush into our lives and bring order to them. So if you're wanting uh, an orientation to this year, as we're talking about encountering God, I would encourage you, it's this, discover the love of God. Anyone here ever been in love? No. My wife's going, no. No, she's not. And I have one of those love with my wife that when I watch a movie and someone meets the love of their lives and thinking, I've had that and I've got that for 33 years. And I, and I remember it orders everything. Love for your kids orders everything. Love for your partner orders everything. The love of God orders the universe itself. First love. So that's our new series, Introduction Over. And let's have a look at John 16. Just going to sh- share a short thought with you and then we're going to pray for one another. Um, anyone here got hot hands because the Holy Spirit's on you? Cause I, could, you come and, cause could you come and put your hands on my shoulders while I'm speaking to warm me up? <laughs> Anyone's got warm hands, you can pray for me. Um, John 16, let's just have a little look. I'm going to pull out one thing this morning. Um, we're reading from verse 5. <clears throat> This is Jesus. But now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you asks, where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief because I've said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, and then I won't read the next bit. I'll jump to verse 12. I have much more to say, more than you can bear now, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, that's the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. He won't speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. I haven't got time to talk about the Trinity, but this is one of those passages, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit revealed in their relationship with one another and how they work together and what I want to pick up on is this why would Jesus going away be better for us why have you ever thought if I'd have been around and seen the feeding of the 5,000 I'd never doubt Jesus have you ever felt that well if I'd seen Jesus raise someone from the dead I'd never doubt Jesus have you ever thought that and the answer is that's not true at all Jesus went from managed to get a crowd of 5,000 and get them down to 12 because he offended them so much. They'd seen all the miracles. But when he said, if you want this in your life, I am the bread of life. Me. And they went, no, thank you. People want the food, want the healings. And sometimes we make the mistake, miracles are amazing. By the way, has anyone had so many miracles in their life they've had enough? <laughs> I haven't. I want miracles. They're a sign but they're a sign of the kingdom. 
And Jesus comes and he says, I need to go away. And you can imagine the disciples, you're thinking, why did he have to go away? Why couldn't he have just stayed? Like, risen from the dead, just live off of that for the next few millennia until he has to go and take us with him. Wouldn't that, isn't that what you would have done? If I was one of the disciples, I'd be thinking, gosh, and you, we know how difficult they found it after he had risen from the dead. Could you just stay with us? And he goes, I need to go. Because it's actually better for you if I go. And he tells us why it's better. So if you thought of that, we're in good company. He had to go and here is why it's better for us. Revealed in these few verses. Jesus returned to the Father because there was something he had for us more than just himself one to one. It was for his experience of the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon every person that wanted to receive it. You see, up until this moment in history, the Holy Spirit had manifest in the Old Testament from time to time, but wasn't received by everyone. And if you're a Christian who's used to being praying to receive the Holy Spirit in the whole of human history up until this point, that did not happen. And Jesus has the most amazing experience of the love of the Father and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, if we forget this so easily, Jesus was fully human, just like you and I. His fullness of the Holy Spirit was not because of his divinity, it was because he was a human being who lived sinlessly and completely in devotion to the Father. And Jesus is like, my work is done. Now I go back to the Father, and when I go to the Father, the Holy Spirit in me comes to you. And that Holy Spirit is the same Holy Spirit that worked in me, and he is available to you and I as much as he was to Jesus. Do you know that? The Holy Spirit that was at work in Jesus is as available to you and I as he was to Jesus, which is why Jesus said, if I go and I send my spirit, you can do anything in my name that I did. That's why this was better for us. Still not with me. Maybe you don't believe me. Jesus' baptism. Anyone remember the gospel stories? Lots of the Gospels don't have the same story, but the Jesus baptism appears in all four Gospels, all four of them, rendered slightly differently from different perspectives that the Gospel writers pick up different things. But broadly, and if we look at this, this will help us understand why Jesus went and the Holy Spirit came. Jesus baptism was a fulfillment of things like Isaiah 64. Any of you remember Isaiah 64? Oh, that you would rend the heavens. Some of you have been in prayer meetings. It's one for prayer. God, open the heavens. What are we praying for this year? God would open the heavens. Jesus' baptism is, a, is Isaiah 64 is a prophecy that's fulfilled in the baptism of Jesus in this way. We know in the gospel stories it says that the heavens are opened. In fact, the word that's used in the Greek is to rent, to tear. You know one of the songs that we just sang about the veil being torn? It's the same word. God, that you would open the heavens. The the darkness over us, the atmosphere of the world over us, the consequences of sin, the work of the devil, would you rip it open? It's the same word that appears about the veil in the temple being torn. God tears open the heavens. Isaiah, people hearing this that knew Isaiah 64 would go, this is it, this is Isaiah 64. The heavens are torn open over Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes down and lands upon Jesus. And how does the Holy Spirit land on Jesus? Like a Dove. Like a dove, a bird, which is still the international symbol of peace, isn't it? Even for people that aren't Christians. Peace. To understand this again, we go all the way back. Where does a dove appear in the Bible? Noah. And Noah sends a dove out and it flies out and it returns and it flies out and it returns. And then I think it's the third time, what happens to it? It doesn't return. Again, this imagery that people at the time would have understood as the fulfillment of God's covenant to his people, the dove, peace. All this is happening at Jesus' baptism. And then we get all the way to the end of John. And we get to this passage. And in these passages, John gives us this extended conversation that Jesus has. And in John 20, we have to move forward a bit. So here Jesus says, I'm going and I'm sending that spirit to you. 
By the way, Isaiah 64, the prophecy in Isaiah 64 is God that would open the heavens and put his spirit down upon us and it would remain upon us. In the baptism of Jesus, we're told that the heavens are open, the spirit comes down, and the spirit remains on Jesus. You following this? Doesn't go. For the first time in the history of the universe, the Holy Spirit has come upon a human being and remained upon them. Jesus. And then Jesus returns to the Father. And in John 20, we see the times when he appears to the disciples again. And the disciples are excited to see him. Anyone remember what the disciples were like? Jesus has risen from the dead. You think they'd be happy. They're not. They're terrified. We're next. (laughs) You keep disappearing. What's happening? And in John 20, Jesus says twice. He says, peace. Don't be afraid. And again, he says, peace, don't be afraid. And then do you remember what he does? We'll get to it when whoever's preaching on John 20 later. Jesus, it says, Jesus says, my peace I give to you. And he breathed on them. That close. I've tried in my prayer times, I imagine myself there and think, what would it be like to have the breath of Jesus so close that I knew he breathed on me? And Jesus goes, so the spirit that is on him comes upon us and can remain upon us. Is anyone excited? That's why he said, it's good for me to go, trust me. Because what I've experienced, Jesus is more excited about what he's experienced with the spirit becoming ours. He gets this to happen in us. Receive the Spirit. So what does that mean for us now? Let's finish with this. What demonic power can block the Holy Spirit from being at work in your life? Anyone know any? It's a trick question. The answer is... Someone's like, is it between one and a million? (laughs) Give me a clue. Can I phone a friend? (laughs) The answer is none. Do you remember? Nothing can separate us. Height nor depth, principalities or powers, COVID or relegation for your favourite football team. Nothing can separate you. Nothing. There is nothing in all of the universe, in all of the world, that can separate a believer from the Holy Spirit. Because to become a Christian, you have to receive the Holy Spirit. You can only become a Christian because the Holy Spirit is already at work in you and helps you realise who Jesus is. Scripture says that again and again. But, what happened? Oh, that was clever. I disappeared, didn't I? But there is something Scripture tells us that blocks the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We're told not to quench the Spirit and grieve the Spirit. And do you know what it is? It's us. It's what goes on between here and here and in here. Stops our experience of the Spirit. And I've taught you before, Scripture talks about the impression of God in us and the impression of the world. There's a Greek word, I love this word. We use it to be impressed, like, oh, isn't that amazing? But the word impress means to be pressed into, like embossed. Has anyone been impressed by the forces of the last two years? And you have a dent in you. You know that thing when you lean on something and then you're like, oh... It's like that happens. The world, the flesh, and the devil impress us. And what the Holy Spirit wants to do is to impress us with Jesus, the image of Jesus in us, to override all those other impressions and to free us up to experience him. And too often, I've noticed this myself, we pray in reaction to the darkness and not God's agenda. And we're not listening to the Holy Spirit and we're not turning ourselves towards the Lord and saying, Holy Spirit, come upon me and fill me. I'm going to share this last thought on this. Um, I've been listening, reading so many books, listening to so many podcasts and videos. If you want to know them, message me and I'll send you all the good stuff I've been listening to. But a little phrase by Bill Johnson. Any of you heard of Bill Johnson? Very well-known pastor. And just throw away thing from him. He talked about the Holy Spirit being like a dove. And he said, 
If you had the Holy Spirit on you like a dove, how do you keep a dove on your shoulder as you walk around? Just the image of, just that image alone. I thought I hadn't even thought of that. He said you'd walk around carefully. You'd walk around attentively. You'd be like, hello. Where are we going next? This immediacy, not you, but with you, on you. I thought, isn't that amazing? Just an attentiveness and carefulness and awareness. And here's the other thing about the dove of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, and this, if I can tie this up with the image of the fire, the Holy Spirit wants to go from you and move on to other people. Have any of you had the experience of walking into the presence of someone who's closer to God than you are? And what happens? You feel it sometimes. There's a strange verse in the Bible where Jesus tells the disciples, when you go into a house, put your peace upon it. You remember that? And he says, and if, and if your peace isn't worthy of it, turn around, shake the dust off and take it away with you. It's kind of strange, isn't it? It's like, well, you can imagine the disciples going, huh, what do we do? What was that house thing? When you walk up, shalom. Is that what we do? That's not quite what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about something people knew in the Old Testament about the presence of God and the peace of God and he's trying to get them to a point of understanding the Holy Spirit and presence remaining on them as a dove, like with Noah, as heaven being opened. And the peace is this. We carry the Holy Spirit with us. And when we walk into a building, we can literally greet it and say, peace be upon this place. And the Holy Spirit goes, We are so used to the darkness being multiplied. We're so used to people that we feel have control of us speaking into our lives. We're so used to the past coming into our lives. And Jesus is saying there is a force that birthed the universe itself. It's the Holy Spirit. And he's like a dove upon your shoulder. Pay attention to him and peace. Peace, peace, peace. The Spirit is so devoted to us. This blew my mind thinking about this for today. The Holy Spirit brings the things of Jesus and he is desperate to give them to us if we'd receive them. Wow. So let's pray for one another. Do you have any small group leaders in the room? If you still have any circulation in your legs, would you stand up for us, please? Small group leaders. I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, how does this all work? How does this all come together? If you've been inspired by the vision and you want the Holy Spirit in your life like this, it's really simple. Three things. Don't stop meeting together as God's people. I heard when I first became a Christian, someone probably, Jesus probably told a disciple who told Brian Durant. Brian told everyone for 2,000 years this. And then he told someone when he was a young man who told me this when I became a Christian. That's how, it, what, what, what Jesus passed on got passed on to me. And it was Jason, you're like a coal in the fire. And one of the ways for a coal to go cold and out Take it out of the fire of worship. Take it out of the fire of a small group of people looking after you and make sure that it gets no fire on its own. And you'll go out. Some of us have friends. You could trace it right now and you could say their faith has gone out because they stopped on their own seeking God. They stopped getting together with a few people to stoke. Do you know what small groups, this is why small group leaders up, to stoke the fire in their lives And they stopped meeting with God's people for the presence of God to be carried with them. And they just went out. And we live at a time where that's a danger. Anyway, so that's how you catch fire. Be with God in worship. Be in a small group. Seek him on your own. And if it's not in our church, then please be released and go and find a church where you can receive the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. You need it. We want you to be on fire. Small group leaders. You open your homes week after week, change nappies, clean up kitchens, hoover, prepare, and live under the weight of, is anyone coming this week? 
And some of us here in our community, I'm speaking this pastorally, there is already the danger. You have already spent last autumn and you're not in a small group and you used to be. And I would ask you to pause and think this. Is my faith any warmer and hotter as a result of not being in small group? Probably not. And then some of us, when we go through our weeks, instead of hosting the presence of Jesus, we host other things, don't we? Our boss we don't like, the things at work that are horrible, the stuff on the news that drove us mad. And we carry that around and we get to small group night in the week and we think, no, I don't want to go to small group and have people lift that off me and let the dove of the Holy Spirit come upon me. I'd rather watch Netflix and keep all this crap on me. And our faith is not any warmer. Because that's what the enemy does. So in a small group leaders, you valiantly open up your homes and your hearts week after week after week. And I felt the Lord say, we should honor you. Because some of you, so many of you have already been talking, the Lord is stirring fire in you. You want fire. You want it for yourself. You want it for the people in your groups. And people here, if you want to catch fire, look around this room. These awesome people. Go to them and let them... Pray for the dove to come upon you.